We're also featuring a, a brief reading from Sanak, which was released in English by the University of Manitoba Press in January 2014, but originally published in Anuktitut in 1987 and then in French translation in 2002. So we're going to have one reading in Anuktitut, and then this will be followed by a reading in English. The first reading will be conducted by Paulette Mituk. Um, Paulette is a graphic design student from the Visual College of Art and Design. Uh, she's from Pangnertung, Nunavut. And then uh, um, Curran Jacobs is a young Ganyagahag, uh, sorry, Ganye, oh my goodness, Ganye Gahaga. Uh, educator from Kanawage. She is currently an undergraduate at Bishop's University, and while her immediate goal is to obtain her teaching certification in the long term, she would like to work as an advocate for de uh, decolonizing educational practices and a more representative curriculum for First Nations youth. So we'll welcome both of them up to the podium. Thank you. I'm going to be reading the Inutitut part on page 64, chapter 19. Teima Kalingulu Jimmy Alulu Tuvasini Rila Tuvasini Rila Nayugu. Panalako Jimialu Kalingukun Kunoko Isako Ay Jimialu Ay Panalillo Jimialu Nangian Naunak Sakto Unua Ilik to Aluma Out of Sarotu. Atok sarok tok sawu, aswila taunong asibok, aksun nami aksun nami gulo, kukiy kukiyuti minilo, sabi minilo, namatuni, ipagamme namau ta ka namau ta Kalingu and his hunting companion were traveling, with spring drawing nearer. It was the day of their departure, and they now stopped for their daily meal. The wind was blowing about the powder snow that covered the ground, and the sky was somewhat hazy on the side from which the wind was blowing. Kalingu's companion built a windbreak with his snow knife. And now the keynote speaker for this evening, Kiwi Martin. Kiwi lives in Treaty 6 territory where she teaches Indigenous literatures at the Department of English and Film Studies. She's also taught for several years with the University of Manitoba's Pangnertung Summer School in Nunavut. Her first book, Stories in a New Skin, her first book, um, won the 2012 Gabrielle Waugh Prize for Canadian Literary Criticism in English. Her current collaborative research project called Creative Conciliations explores the ways in which indigenous arts have the potential to transform prevailing ideas about reconciliation. Please welcome Dr. Kiwi Martin. Unukut, good evening everyone. Can you see me back here? I feel like I'm off in the distance. Okay, good. Uh, it's a pleasure to be visiting the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I want to say a huge thank you to Deanna Rader and her entire team, everyone who brought us all together and made this event possible. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> and uh, for any Inuktitut speakers in the crowd, I wanted to say Kiviu Yunga, Edmonton Miotau Yunga, I 
I'd like to begin tonight with a story from the Greenlandic amateur ethnographer, Knut Rasmussen. In early December of 1921, Rasmussen arrived at the Hudson's Bay Company trading post at Nauyat, or Repulse Bay, in what is now Nunavut, as one of the first stops on his famous Fifth Thule expedition. At Nauyat, he had the good fortune of meeting an elder named Ivaluatjuk, the brother of the shaman Abva. Making his introductions, Rasmussen began a few stories belonging to his own people, the Kalathlit Inuit of Greenland, and he was rewarded when Ivaluatjuk offered a hunting song in return. The song, which opens with the lines, cold and mosquitoes, these two pests come never together, contains the reflections of a hunter sprawled on the snow and ice, waiting for his prey to materialize. As in many personal songs or pisit, the singer incorporates the process of composition into the song itself. He sings, I seek and spy something to sing of, the caribou with the spreading antlers. So the hunter or the singer is in fact seeking and finding two things simultaneously, both the animal that he is hunting and the subject of his song. He has found something to sing about and something to eat. Both are things that he can take home to his family and community. The processes of hunting and of song making then go hand in hand. This idea has particular resonance in 1921 as the song is performed at the trading post. Ivaluatjuk is by then an old man, too old to be doing much hunting anymore. Instead, the elder says he has only the old stories and songs to fall back upon. They are the sustenance that he brings to his family and that he now offers hospitably to the stranger Rasmussen. The song has thus been hunted harvested and is now being shared, just like protocol requires that food be shared and never hoarded. In my talk this evening, I'm going to be thinking about the implications of understanding songs and stories, also known as literature or literary texts, as nourishment, as meat, or even as animals that are hunted, harvested, and consumed. In particular, I'm asking what the ethics of harvesting in Inuit territory can teach us about ethical ways of consuming or using Inuit texts. I know that this anthology, analogy between hunting and reading might worry some listeners, as the process of acquiring skins and meat requires the death of the animal. Many people, particularly in urban areas, are uncomfortable with the idea of killing a wild animal for food or fur, and our southern grocery stores and malls make our reliance on other animal products either conveniently abstract or even in some cases non-existent. Hunting is thus often understood as something to be carried out only in the case of great necessity because people have no other choice. It's pretty hard to grow food in the Arctic. But Inuit hunting and harvesting is not carried out only because of necessity. Rather, it's part of a complex ethical system that, although often at odds with southern or at least urban sensibilities, stresses the interconnectedness of both humans and animals. Inuit songs and stories, many of which center around the harvesting of animals, can therefore teach readers about appropriate ways of interacting with Inuit texts. As a khalunaq, or white reader, I have often worried about the ethics of my own engagement with Inuit and other indigenous texts. This is fairly common and very necessary. Like many other scholars, I have worried about misunderstanding, about appropriation, about exploitation. But it may surprise you to hear that Inuit texts and time spent in Inuit territory have actually taught me to be a little less hesitant about sinking my teeth in. I'm wondering what happens if we think about the publication or sharing of Inuit literatures as being like an invitation to a feast. Declining that food or refusing to eat can be rude or insulting, but taking part in the feast opens up many possibilities. What if we think about the reading or consuming of Inuit literature as placing readers into a relationship with those texts, much the same way that a feast solidifies relations between the host, the guest, and the food? What, then, 
are the responsibilities that come with the hunting and harvesting of Inuit literatures. In my first year of university when I was 18 years old, I took an intro philosophy class like many first year students do. In this class, animal rights and the ethics of food was a major focus and a strong interest of the professor. He told us that humanity had now developed to the point where reliance on animals for food was no longer required for our survival. We now have the technology, he said, to choose a more ethical path where the existence of our species does not have to rely on the suffering of others. At the time, I was compelled by this, and it led to a year-long attempt to be a vegetarian. My family in Alberta, some of whom raise cattle for a living, were less than impressed. (laughs) You're not eating meat because you took a philosophy class? My uncle Randy said as he stood outside the barn in his coveralls, his face dotted with squashed mosquitoes. But as it turned out, I was a horrible, lazy vegetarian. (laughs) As my friends can vouch, I subsisted mainly on pasta and Cheerios, and within a few months, I was pretty malnourished and anemic. (laughs) Gradually, I started to sneak fish and meat back into my diet, but it wasn't until years later that I actually began to to think seriously about the ethics, not just the necessity of relying on animals for food, The place where I had the opportunity to think about this more carefully was in and around the community of Pannotto, or Pangertung Nunavut, which I first visited in 2007 and have returned to many times. There I had the opportunity to go seal hunting with people like Paulette's late uncle Noah and his family. I've experienced being in a small boat in Cumberland Sound for eight hours, getting cold and hungry, wondering if we would find something to take back to camp for dinner. I've seen the strange way in which the seals will sometimes come up near the boats and wait, watching us, and I kept wondering why they wouldn't just swim away. I've seen how a good hunter, like Noah was, can kill a ringed seal with one clean shot before gunning the engine to collect it before it sinks. I felt the thrill of gathering around a seal being expertly butchered on the rocks, everyone diving in to get a piece of the precious liver or maybe a rib, children being handed pieces of the trachea, and everything else, all the meat and organs and braided intestines being carefully cut up and put into a giant cooking pot, which will soon yield the most delicious uyu or stew that will keep the entire camp warm for hours. I've been taught the laborious process of preparing sealskins for sewing, and I wear my sealskin mittens with pride. I've also observed the astronomical prices in the northern and co-op grocery stores in town, and I have required the use of thousands of gallons of jet fuel as I hauled hundreds of kilograms of beans, lentils, and rice through the airports on the way to Nunavut to to sustain our groups of highly food-conscious southern students during our stay. I've learned then that in Pengertung, eating a seal or an arctic char or a caribou is significantly more environmentally friendly than eating a vegetarian diet. But eating seal instead of avocados is not just about choosing the lesser of two evils. To open up this idea, I'd like to show you a very short film called Tungiyuk, produced by Iglulik Isuma Productions, the renowned makers of Atanarjuat, the fast runner. So again, Tungiyuk means he, she, or it transforms or shapeshifts. And in the film, we see Tagak transform from wolf to caribou, to caribou meat, to ringed seal, each death leading to the continuation of life. But all the while, Tagak's human body is apparent, even quite prominent, and each of the animals is therefore personified. Thus we see the caribou, the hunted caribou, not only in its animal form, but as a person, bleeding, weakening, and dying, transforming from tutu, or caribou, to tutuminik, former caribou, or caribou meat. And just like in the old story of Arnaq Tartu, the human shaman who transformed into many animals, dying in each form and reincarnating into another, Tagak, naked and bloody at the flow edge, 
falls into the water and shapeshifts into a ringed seal swimming up to the breathing hole where it is shot by the waiting hunter. At the end, Tagak appears in the form of a human woman seated with her husband next to the former seal, caressing the opening in its belly and taking her first bite of fresh, raw seal meat before looking into the camera with what I take to be defiant pleasure. This film appeared in 2009, the same year that the then Governor General Michael Jean sparked a media frenzy by eating a bite of raw seal heart during a visit to Rankin Inlet. Canadian news services emphatically described the Governor General as having gobbled a dripping chunk of heart and then wiping the blood from her fingers. <laughs> Reactions from officials in Europe and from animal rights groups evoked the language of barbarism even more strongly. In the words of Dan Matthews, the vice president of PETA, or the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, it amazes us that a Canadian official would indulge such, such bloodlust. It sounds like she's trying to give Canadians an even more Neanderthal image around the world than they already have. The hunting of seals in Canada has long been a subject of controversy. In the late 1960s, the International Fund for Animal Welfare began using images of the commercial Atlantic seal hunt to sway public opinion against the industry, which had been a major coastal economy for centuries. In the 1970s, Greenpeace joined the campaign, as did celebrities such as the French actress Brigitte Bardot, who helped to skyrocket the, in the issue to international attention by snuggling up to white-coated harp seal pups in front of the cameras. These campaigns resulted in the 1983 ban by the European Economic Commission on importing Canadian white coat seal products. Although the ban targeted only white coats, harp seals under 12 days old, harvested in the Atlantic commercial hunt and therefore exempted the Inuit seal hunt, which primarily focuses on adult ring seals, the result of the ban was the near total collapse of the market for seal products. The impact on Inuit communities was nothing short of devastating. Inuit had only very recently been moved off the land and into permanent settlements where they were required to adjust to a different economic model and to try to find sources of income, such as working in the mines. After the European ban on seal products, the government of the Northwest Territories, which then included Nunavut, estimated that Inuit villages in the NWT lost 60% of their total annual community income. Those, the, the statistics were worse in some places. Though greatly diminished, both the commercial Atlantic and the Inuit seal hunts have continued, as have the protests. Taking over for Bridget Bardot is the Canadian, former Playboy playmate, Pamela Anderson, who last December with Hollywood producer Sam Simons visited St. John's, Newfoundland to offer the Canadian Sealers Association $1 million if it achieved a government buyout of the industry. The offer was declined. Uh, meanwhile, the World Trade Organization recently upheld the European Union's 2009 ban on importing all seal products. While this particular embargo did include an exemption for Inuit seal products resulting from hunts conducted traditionally, it also resulted in a further dramatic drop in seal prices. And at the 2009 fur auction in North Bay, Ontario, not a single one out of 11,000 available seal pelts was sold. In other words, the exemptions that these bans have made for Indigenous hunters don't work. Instead, these stories demonstrate the ways in which the actions undertaken by even a few individuals in one part of the world can have rippling and often destructive consequences thousands of miles away. Tanya Tagak's erotic depiction of the hunting and eating of seal meat thus offers a wonderful twist on the tradition of busty blonde bombshells cuddling up enticingly to seals on the ice. And the film makes no attempt to downplay or conceal the violence or gore of the hunt, but rather lingers on the sensuality of the animal bodies, even as they're butchered. We're invited to watch Tagak rolling in the snow in a passionate embrace with a generous cut of tutuminik, caribou meat, and to contemplate the intimate, almost vulva-shaped incision that reveals the delicious organs of the seal. The film thus takes a major risk in using this explicit imagery, particularly in combination with sexuality, that other provocateur. 
For years, graphic images of hunting have been the worst enemy of hunters, as the images can be taken out of context and used to shock and provoke urban audiences into moral outrage and political action. Given the reaction of the mainstream to Mikael Jean's singular bite of seal heart, how do the filmmakers think audiences will respond to this? But as Tagak lifts her gaze and slowly savors her mouthful, she seems to dare her viewers to respond using the language of savagery or bloodlust. This feast is not a process that she's engaging in unawares or even out of strict necessity. Rather, this is a conscious, deliberate, and most importantly, a pleasurable act, one carried out without moral conflict or shame. In the 1920s, when Rasmussen was visiting Ivaluarjuk's brother Abva, he asked what the greatest danger faced by his people was. Abva famously responded that the greatest peril of life lies in the fact that our diet consists entirely of souls. That is, Abva knew that all of the animals that Emi relied on for food, clothing, and fuel have souls, have consciousness. And in many of the old stories, animals are personified, even taking off their skin clothing indoors to reveal the forms of people underneath, as you saw. Furthermore, because souls are reincarnated, if an animal is mistreated in one body, it can make the decision not to return to the hunter in the next. If, however, a hunter and his family treat the animal's body appropriately, for instance, by sharing the meat or maybe by returning any leftover seal parts to the sea and caribou parts to the land, then that animal will be willing to return and to offer itself to the hunter again and again. Interestingly, then, the animal rights activists and the hunters seem to be working on the same principle, that the animals are sentient beings, but the ways in which they interpret and act on this principle are radically opposed. In the 2010 Isuma documentary, Kaperanga Yuk, Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change, elders are interviewed about the changes that they are observing in their world, including the impact on animals like polar bears. Consistently, elders assert that the real threat to Arctic wildlife is not climate change, but rather the interference of wildlife biologists and preservationists who tamper with animals by chasing, tranquilizing, tagging, and collaring them. For older Inuit, this tampering or meddling with animals is a profoundly disrespectful and dangerous breach of traditional law. Elder Rita Nashuk of Khaluit speaks powerfully to this idea. She says in the film, and this is in translation, I'm a protector of animals, a real animal rights activist. When animals are mistreated, I'm reminded of my late grandmother's teaching. Unless you're going to kill an animal, do not cause it harm. Wildlife biologists are the ones endangering wildlife. Then they suspect Inuit over-harvesting as the cause. We are told you must not touch protected animals. Inuit do not endanger animals, nor do they cause needless suffering. We love our animals. Hunters who rely on animals are profoundly invested in the well-being of wildlife populations and in the maintenance of their habitats. This is why Inuit traditional law has such strict guidelines about the ways in which it's appropriate to interact with wildlife and with the land. Inuit law also has tremendous respect for the intelligence and agency of animals, so much so that the animal rights campaigns that depict Arctic animals as helpless or incapable come across as patronizing and disrespectful. In many of the old stories, the consequences for breaking the law manifested in the form of an absence of game, and it would be the job of the angakok, or shaman, to determine who or what was responsible for the defense and to set things into balance again. Human actions are thus understood as having significant impacts on the natural world. Indeed, as we witness in Tungyuk, the human and animal worlds are deeply and irrevocably connected. Inuit leaders have also long been outspoken about the hypocrisy of the southern squeamishness about seal hunting, which seems to be largely based on the cuteness of seals with their oversized eyeballs and general appearance of helplessness. Meanwhile, the beef, pork, and chicken industries continue to raise and slaughter animals in terrible factory conditions with the liberal use of hormones and antibiotics, but away from the cameras. 
In 2006, Inuit students Tommy Akulukjuk and Karina Nayulia created a spoof Save the Baby Veal campaign <laughs> and cuddled up to a baby cow on a poster that carried the subtitle, Avoid Cultural Prejudice. As Inuk writer Ayu Peter has pointed out, the limited income from seal hunting is sometimes one of the only things that allows Inuit families to go to the store to buy milk or coffee at exorbitant prices and also to buy the fuel and ammunition that allows them to keep hunting. She also reminds us that hunting doesn't only result in sustenance and income, but that it also has tremendous cultural and social significance, allowing families to work together to acquire and to share healthy and delicious traditional food as a continuation of ancient practices despite several decades of attempted assimilation. So while I may risk offending, especially because I'm in Vancouver, those who have made, for their own reasons, the decision not to consume animal products. I wonder, for my own part, whether the ethics of vegetarianism are as straightforward as they might seem. After all, even when we don't eat meat, we are all consuming natural resources all the time, as we breathe the air, drink the water, and rely on growing things. Many people believe that all of these things, not just animals, have spirits too. And when we don't make use of animal products, what are the alternatives? Imported quinoa for our suppers, synthetic petroleum-based materials for our winter clothing, the expansion of treaty-violating fossil fuel industries for our economies. Are these things necessarily ethical or without consequence? At least the hunting and harvesting of wild meat and fur can be local and renewable, and it can serve to remind us viscerally and powerfully of the relationships that we all have to the land, how desperately we need it, how delicate the balance is that keeps our resources available, and how we have a responsibility to maintain that balance. While I may seem to have wandered far away from literature, <laughs> I promise that I'm going somewhere with this, or at least trying to. I want to come back around now to the concept that I opened with, the idea of Inuit literatures as being nourishing and meat-like. When Rasmussen was visiting the community of Angmagsalik in southwestern Greenland, he recorded an iviusilk, an embarrassing song meant to expose and correct bad behavior, that goes as follows. <clears throat> I put some words together. I made a little song. I took it home one evening, mysteriously wrapped, disguised. Underneath my bed it went. Nobody was going to share it. Nobody was going to taste it. I wanted it for me, me, me. Secret, undivided. That poem has since been entitled Song to a Miser. This is one of many Inuit literary warnings against the danger of hoarding. Usually these texts refer to people who are stingy about sharing food or about helping others, but here the singer suggests that the hoarding of songs is as undesirable as the refusal to, di to distribute more material resources such as meat. Like food, songs are meant to be shared. This sharing often happens along kinship lines, but even outsiders are swiftly drawn into that network. The very first day that I was ever in Pangertung, a complete stranger gave me an entire Arctic char because I happened to be walking by as he was clearing his nets. I couldn't believe it. That's what it's for, he said, for sharing. Over the years, though, I've observed the hesitancy that many of our southern students feel in Pangertung when encountering such generosity. Many of us had learned at home that it's good manners to refuse coffee or food so as to not inconvenience your host, particularly when resources are scarce. So many of us had to learn to take the risk of accepting, of participating, and therefore of incurring the responsibility to reciprocate. While few people in Pang overtly try to correct the behavior of Kalunat, white people, I was grateful to a young friend who said one day to her southern visitors, I find it very insulting when you don't eat with us. When a meal has been shared, after all, a relationship has been created, and there is the possibility, the requirement even, of returning to that house, maybe next time bringing along a bag of groceries or another offering, even a story or song. 
As a teacher of indigenous literatures, I often encounter a reluctance amongst students and instructors to engage with indigenous texts. This is primarily a concern of non-Indigenous students who fear that they don't have the right to speak about Indigenous issues, that they will offend someone, that their reading or commentary will function or be seen as a continuation of colonial practices, which after all seek control over Indigenous resources. But even Indigenous students in my classes express similar concerns about not having the right or not knowing enough because they weren't taught their language or because they grew up in the city or because they're fair-skinned. There are many, many reasons that people will invoke or that they've been taught not to engage. My colleague and friend, Sam Kegney, has a beautiful synopsis of this in his book, Magic Weapons, where he raises concerns about the many different strategies employed by non-Indigenous critics to attempt to mitigate their potential negative influence on the text. And he urges readers not to be so cautious or so terrified of criticism that they actually limit the close engagements and disagreements that foster the growth of the field. I apologize for any weaknesses that might emerge in my analysis, he says, but I don't apologize for analyzing. Another friend and colleague, the Pepas Chase Cree scholar, Dwayne Donald, often points out that colonization is the extended process of denying relationship. And I think that this statement could have powerful resonance for literary critics as it suggests that colonization can be perpetuated not necessarily when readers consume texts, when they use those resources, but rather when they don't when they attempt not to impose or to trespass on the literature and therefore ultimately not to incur any responsibilities to it, to its author, or to the community that it came from. I don't mean to suggest here that appropriation and exploitation are not still very real dangers, but I wonder if perhaps those problems in part stem from the failure of many readers to reciprocate for the intellectual and emotional nourishment and often the material benefit that they have accrued from consuming indigenous literatures. In other words, they have failed to be good guests or good relations. How then can the Inuit ethics of hunting and harvesting animals teach us to be better readers? First of all, as we see in Tungi, they remind us of the ways in which seemingly distinct worlds like the northern and southern parts of the lands known as Canada are irrevocably interconnected and constantly impacting one another just as the hunter's actions can influence the decision of an animal's soul to return in another form, and just as the actions of Southerners can cripple the sealskin market or drastically alter the Arctic environment. Just as we could all be wearing more sealskin to support indigenous hunting families in the north, we could all be buying, reading, and teaching more Inuit texts. Go team Ajit! Which... <laughs> which after, after all are being offered to us by innovative publishers and production companies like Inhabit Media and Isuma. At least for me, as someone who has been fed from many Inuit texts and has benefited greatly from that, these are a couple of the things that I feel obliged to do. It's important to remember, though, that within Inuit traditions, not all interactions with or uses of animals are equally ethical. There are firm laws about how those relationships should function. And likewise, I'm not suggesting that all uses of Inuit texts are equally defensible. As I end this, I'm struck by the words of Rita Nashuk's grandmother, unless you're going to kill an animal, do not cause it harm. As readers, how do we ensure that we're not just tampering with, teasing, or torturing texts? How do we know that we're actually killing and consuming them? Or in other words, accepting the gift that was offered. I know that this may still sound like a strange question, but I think that the answer could lie in the idea of tungiuk. Maybe we need to ask with every text that we read, has a transformation occurred? Have we transformed the literature into a shape that can nourish us? Have we been changed by the interaction? If so, then we may have successfully entered into relationship. When that we then accept the responsibility of honoring, maintaining, and reciprocating for in whatever ways we can. Thank you.
Kivi said she'd be willing to take questions, so if you raise your hand and just wait a moment, we'll bring a microphone to you so that your question can be heard by the whole audience. So, are there questions for Kivi? Hi, Kiwi. Um, it's Angela back here from SFU. Um, uh, first, congratulations. Um, and I just noticed, obviously, you're speaking. You started in Inuit and have said some things. Are you are you fluent? Um, no. So you just and and like you've just learned that through your time in the north. Or can you speak to that anyway? To learning Inuit. Uh, I've, so. I've started studying Inuktitut at the University of Toronto. They have a couple of classes there and uh, took two courses before going to Pangertung and I got to go for five summers and in that time I uh, did my best to learn as much as I could but I'm definitely not fluent and I think that would take a lifetime and hopefully I'll be able to keep learning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, there are a lot of a lot of things I'd like to to ask you, but I guess one thing I, I'm, I'm particularly struck by is uh, the metaphor of uh, of the sharing of the meal and uh, of the commun communal quality of uh, of meal sharing, and especially within Indigenous contexts. Um, I'm wondering, though, I guess how that makes us think about reading because we tend to consider you know for for very good reasons we tend to consider reading as a solitary thing um, and I'm, I'm just wondering what, what what you make of that I guess is this a, a movement uh, to, to sort of think about reading in a much more communal way in a way that maybe more uh, that we would think of storytelling being a much more communal thing so I wonder if you could maybe expand on that a little bit for us you know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, but I may borrow that idea for the paper that I'm trying to... Ex no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, that's, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about the importance of the, the communal idea. Um, I think what I'm, I'm kind of responding to is, um, is that reluctance that I've noticed both among students and really in my own practice as a reader, um, that I... That, that desire to sort of remain distant, at a safe distance, at a, a non-risky location in the corner of the living room where you're not eating because you don't want to be a bother. Um, and and I, I just heard so many people sort of worrying about the dangers of, of consuming. And I think consumption is a big issue for a lot of us today, right? Overconsumption especially. And I just, I guess I started to wonder what would happen if we made peace with the idea of consuming, that it's part of the world that we live in, uh, not as a way to sort of justify any any unethical or unethical activity, but um, rather to think about what what we accrue then by consuming those resources. Um, but I think you've struck a important aspect that I hadn't thought about there. So thank you. <laughs> I am available for discussion afterwards as we mingle also. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. That was just gorgeous reading. But I, I, I sit there as somebody who looks at, well, for example, Apelli's texts and then think about, try to link them to sort of traditional texts or make sense of them. And I, you know, wonder, you know, there's, it goes against so many of the things that we've learned, uh, uh, you know, uh, or, or ways of analyses, you know, gender, using gender, for example, or, uh, you know, power or even spirituality. And I, I wonder if there is, why is there this, I don't know, such a separation? I mean, we have this room full of indigenous critics. How, I, I, I'm going to bet very few who study Inuit literature or teach it on a regular basis. And I just wonder if you can um, give some kind of sense of why there is this barrier. Because we, we, we feel, feel very happy to tackle difficult, very difficult texts, but yet not this fear. 
and I'm just wondering if you have any words of advice, actually. Yeah. Um, that's something I have wondered about. And I, I will say, though, that I think, you know, you, you are teaching them. And um, there's been a lot of people out there who have taught Ipilli before. And things like Atan um, al the fast runner, really made those, those texts accessible. Um, I, think, I think, I don't know, it's hard for me to speculate. I've, I've heard different things on this issue. But um, one issue, I think, is that there isn't a university in the north. And a lot of us, I think, are very rightly focused on the local context. I know that when I first arrived at the U of A, fresh out of my dissertation, I was teaching a lot of Inuit texts, and it showed up in interesting ways on my course evaluations. And students would be like, so what's with the Inuit texts? And are, are you Inuk, or do you just like them? That was, what was, that, was what, that was what one student said in my office. I was like, I love, I love the way they just see right, right to the truth. Um, so, and, and, and actually in the years since then I've started to learn a lot more about what it means to be teaching in Treaty 6 territory and I've learned about my, what my Cree and Stoney students, what their background is and what the history of the land I'm teaching on is and, and that has definitely taken prominence over the teaching of Inuit texts, even in my own classes and I, I feel vaguely guilty about that but it also makes a certain sense for us to sort of be focused on the local. Um, at the same time, I mean, the... Connections with the North are, are I, I, that's one thing I want to suggest, are something that we all do have, even though it seems uh, kind of remote or di distant or different, and it is absolutely different. Um, but uh, with the prominence of concerns about climate change, I think, and, and many other things, I th and the seal hunt, um, I think it's, it becomes even just more apparent how connected we are, and I think, I think it is a necessity, especially, and also we have many Inuit students in our southern universities as well, and I want to be thinking about them, and how even at the U of A, this, a northern institution, there are hardly any Inuit studies classes at all. I don't, I don't know if there are any. Um, so I guess I'm hoping, to, what I'm hoping to say here is that I, I hope people will take the risks of, of trying. And even though a lot of texts in the Inuit tradition are not, um, a lot of them are not in English, um, are, and they're not always um, very easily legible, I don't know if that's very different from other difficult texts, like the ones you've mentioned, or other indigenous texts. So, so I guess I don't really know why people feel reluctant, but I'm hoping that, I'm hoping to compel them. And, I'm hope, and I know too that, you know, people like you featuring Ajit and and um, other folks out there who are interested in Inuit texts, I, I know that that will start to make us to, it'll start to make us think more deeply about the connections that we do have and, and about ways of trying to respectfully approach those texts. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, my heart is beating fast because I'm sitting here as a European and also as somebody who, together with his students, translated the diary of Abram Ulrikab. And uh, a lot of things that you, you said sort of brought back uh, a lot of things in my mind. Uh, one thing, uh, the campaign in Europe against seal products, uh, I remember, I think it was in... 87 or 89, I was at McGill, and it was already then being discussed. And I think that Brigitte Bardot, her right-wing politics, she's really quite a non-person in Europe. Uh, however, uh, there unfortunately still are those restrictions in Europe on seal products. But I think we have to also be careful um, not to generalize, uh, and I'd like to share with you something that um, upset me some, some a while ago. I told you that the students and I translated that diary, mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have been able to do that if Robin McGraw mm -hmm. hadn't given me that hint years and years ago. Yeah. And the students did that in their spare time. We had no research grant, nothing. It was Partly what? Idealism, we've translated lots of things, so, so that was not uh, something special. But uh, one of the reasons the students did that was because it, it's a shameful part of our history, but it has to be exposed. 
it was very difficult. There were lots of tears shed. Students felt very upset and ashamed, but they were, they, it was done in the hope to return a text to Inuit communities so that they know what befell their ancestors when they perished in Europe. Then, two years later, in uh, Ideas, the BBC program, there was a two-hour uh, 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 documentary on uh, the diary of Abraham mm -hmm. Ulrika, which I think was very well done. Uh, I was interviewed for that, and I tried to impress on the interviewer that these were German students who did that, uh, aware of our history and our, our legacy, and did it to share and maybe to return something. Yeah. Uh, I was quite shocked when the BBC uh, program uh, finished because the last five minutes there was a sudden change. Uh, you know, everything that I told the interviewer about the students, he didn't want to hear. There was no acknowledgement in the whole program that this was actually done by some German students, and nobody in Canada would have known mm -hmm. without the work of those students over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in the end, uh, there were quotations, and the whole thing was connected with the seal, with the uh, um, attempt to open the European market for seals. And the gist of it was, the Europeans are still as racist as that. Yeah, you, you should re uh, listen, you can uh, listen to that online and notice how the tone changes. So what I'm saying is I felt really that my students got a wrong deal. Uh, what they were trying to do was the exact opposite and I think they achieved that mm -hmm. because the text has been uh, is being translate is now translated also in French, and it's uh, translated in other languages, and so the story is out, and I'm very happy about mm -hmm. that. But it was utilized in the end for opening a market. And my final question to all of you is: uh, Is it really the European market that hurts that? Aren't there 30 million or more people in Canada? And where can you buy those seal products? in southern Canada. I haven't seen those shops, and I guess there are some animal rights people in Canada who stop that, so I don't think it's just Europe, it's Canada also. Oh, I absolutely agree with you, and no, it's, it's not just Europe, and I mean, Pamela Anderson is leading the charge on this, and in, in southern Canada, I mean, wearing sealskin boots around or carrying purses or mitts is, um, you get very strong reactions from people and it's a very emotional issue. So although Europe is a strong economic driver, it is certainly not the, I mean, the U.S. has a, has a similar ban and that was also a major issue. Um, no, I, I don't, I'm not blaming Europeans as the source of this problem at all. Um, in fact, I, I'm really more concerned really with, with folks in southern Canada and with, especially with people who are electing governments who make decisions that profoundly impact the North, and they, they have a very direct impact on what's happening in the territories. And, um, and I just want to say thank you for doing that work that you did, because I'm really happy to have that book. Yeah. Okay, I might get the dates wrong, so Professor Lutzi might have to help me, but um, so Abraham Ulrikab and his family traveled um, from Labrador to Berlin, I believe. Germany. By a Norwegian sea captain who was looking for English people to be uh, on people's shows and mm -hmm. all in Europe, where people uh, went to circuses or to zoos, yeah. where people were uh, at the height of colonialism, right of civility. Yeah. And it was a way of making money. Yeah. Mm. And what happened was that uh, the, the captain, he was very ill and he forgot to inoculate them, which had been standard by them. So all, the whole family and three others who were non-baptized from further north, eight other people died within three months of their arrival in Europe. And they went to, to Hamburg, to Berlin, to Prague, to Paris. Most of them died in Paris. Mm -hmm.
and she's publishing uh, the diary and also the diary of Dr. Kim, the sea captain, mm -hmm. who accompanied them, both in English and translation. My sister in law just did the French translation, and I did the English translation. And that book is online constantly. So the sad thing is that these eight people died, um, and it's, it's just terrible if you hear that story how people were exhibited in the which was standard at that time. In this country, it's Germany, it was the forerunner of Wild West shows and circles. Mm -hmm. Should I repeat any of that for the. Do I need to repeat that? Okay. okay. I don't know. Thank you. Hello, Kiwi. I guess it's me here. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you very much for a very enjoyable, inspiring talk. And I certainly like the image of, um, or I like your encouragement um, to critics, to readers, to feast on indigenous literature. I like that very much. It sounds horrible, though, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a very good image. But I like it even more, or I found it very important, that you said some responsibilities come with that feasting. Uh, you know? uh, so and that's where my question is. How do we really practice these responsibilities? How do we give back? Um, the Cree scholar, Willy Amin, has a very good lecture on YouTube uh, called Knowledge as a Being, where he makes a point that universities um, grow and grow and feast on the knowledge coming from the communities. And the communities, they become smaller and smaller, they kind of starve. So one component here, one element, one, one actor is really feasting and become strong. And academics have, have great salaries and CVs and all of that, and a lot of prestige. And what about the communities from which this knowledge, the literature, and everything else comes? And how do we reconcile this? Mm -hmm. That's a, still a question for me. Thank it's, you. It's still a question for me, too. It really is. And, um, and I, don't think I, have, I don't think I have the answer. It's something that I think about um, kind of as an individual right now, although as I move along in my career, I, I know I'm going to need to try to influence the administration a little bit more. It's challenging. Um, but no, you're right. And that's, so that's something I think about a lot. And, um, and I worry quite a lot about exactly that, about the university as this um, hungry creature. Um, and, and about, you know, the way in which even when I encounter, you know, talented young students, I was talking about this this morning, um, and I'm like, you need to come and do a PhD. We need to scoop you in here so that you can make this place better and we can feast upon your brains, basically. And it's, and, and so that, that is a problem. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's that sort of expansion of the enlightenment that continues in, in our universities where we're constantly seeking to bring things out of the darkness and into our libraries. And, so that, that is a problem, and, um, and I guess I don't want to go as far as to say that that should stop, but rather that, like you're suggesting, there needs to be a flow in the other direction. Um, and it's something that I struggle with. So for me, sometimes this, is, this happens in very material ways, um, sharing resources of all kinds. Um, so with, with friends and family in the north, um, Trying to create opportunities for you know, writers at the same time it's that's it's the same it's the same cycle and maybe that is maybe that is a relationship of sorts but it's something that that we need to work on um, when I try to think about what the kind of hunting ethics say about that at a feast I guess um, I guess what I've learned is that you need to you need to share. Um, and you need to behave respectfully towards that animal. And I guess I wonder if there are ways that we can also do that with text. And if, if by the sharing of texts, if that, is, if that is a start. But I think you've pointed to exactly the problem. Hi. Oh, Paulette says, talk to your elders. <laughs> <laughs>